All right, guys, I'm going to pause to order here uh, for another uh, China Speaker Series. Um, this is actually part of the Brumley uh, uh, Series uh, Mentorship Program. I'm Joshua Eisenman, I'm an assistant professor here at the LBJ School, and I specialize in Chinese politics, international relations, <laughs> politics, etc. Um, so what I want to do here is just give you a sense of what we're doing here at the Strauss Center with regard to China-related work, um, and I'll tell you uh, uh, where we're going, and um, then introduce uh, my mentee, if that's a word, uh, Harry Kim, who will introduce our excellent speaker uh, for today, uh, Ian Soon. Um, so I guess I should begin uh, by thanking the amazing team we have at the Strauss Center, uh, Anne and John and Bobby and you know, everyone. I mean, these kinds of events that you see Strauss Center constantly putting on is the product of their hard work, their effort, dedication, and time. And because my office is next to Jean's, I know she's there every day to like 6.30 p.m. So they're you know, working really hard and they're doing great stuff here, so we need to recognize that. Um, I, I also want to say a few words about where we've been. For those of you who've been at the LBJ School for more than a couple of years, which I guess is almost none of you, um, we, uh, this is part of a, what has become an excellent speaker series that we've been doing on a semester-by-semester semester basis. Um, and we brought in some of the top people studying Chinese politics and international affairs. Uh, people like Andrew Nathan, Nadej Roland, Derek Mitchell, A. Denmark, and of course today, uh, Yun Sun. So um, you can see that we're really trying our best to find people who are experienced in both the policy side and uh, in terms of the academic side. Um, and so we're trying to kind of bridge this gap uh, that you talked about a little bit uh, a few moments ago uh, between the policy world and the academic world and try to help them to talk to each other better. Um, so that's part of uh, what we're doing through this Understanding China series. And there's more to come. So February 1st, we're going to hold a full day-long conference on the domestic influences in U.S.-China relations. Um, and uh, that, that conference is going to be headlined by Ambassador Inman um, as the keynote. And we're going to have a series of the people that I would consider to be the leaders in U.S.-China relations, both future and present, who are going to be speaking, presenting papers. And that is all going to be going into a special issue of the Journal of Contemporary China that I'll be guest editing. So again, the effort here is to bring policy-relevant work and then put it in academic venues and let this loop continue and feed itself. Um, so I want to invite all of you to that. That'll be on February 1st, um, and it's going to be an amazing event. We've already got the, uh, the schedule draft done, um, so I want to put that on your calendar. I also want to let you know that there's an effort going on right now to do even more work on China-related issues, and this is ongoing. It's not finished. But um, as some of you may have seen online, we did an excellent event uh, last semester with the Carnegie Council for Ethics and International Affairs in New York about possible war with China, where we, where we brought um, some very sophisticated people. Um, that's a podcast I would encourage you to listen to. And it's looking like, although not for sure, that we may expand and continue our relationship with Carnegie going forward. We're also going to do things like book launches and other talks. So um, anybody who has any ideas on what you think would be a great thing for us to be doing that's going to help serve the faculty, students, and alumni of this university and this school in particular, please come and talk to me. My office hours are today, 2.30 to 4.30. You are welcome. We would love to have your ideas to incorporate them because at the end of the day, you guys are our clients. If you guys are sitting in these seats, that means we're doing the right thing. So um, I just want to kind of open that door for you guys to help feed into that process so we can deliver great programs for you. Um, and uh, without further ado, let me go ahead and turn over to Harry Kim, my mentee, uh, who's going to introduce our excellent speaker today, Ms. Yun Soon from Stimson. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Eisenman. It's, it's, a, it's a pleasure to introduce all of you to our guest speaker today, Ms. Yun Soon, um, who I tried to meet when I was in DC doing a poor internship at the Wilson Center. Sorry. But I'm glad that I was able to find and meet her today. Um, so without any waiting, uh, Ms. Yun Sin is a senior associate with the East Asia program at the Simpson Center, and is also a non-resident fellow in the Asia uh, Africa Growth Initiative at the Brookings Institute. Uh, from 2011 to early 2014, she was a visiting uh, fellow at the Brookings Institute. From 2008 to 2011, she was a China analyst for the international, international crisis group in Beijing, specializing on China's foreign policy towards conflict countries and the developing world. Uh, prior to International Crisis Group, she worked on U.S.-Asia relations in Washington, D.C. for five years. Uh, she earned her master's degree in international policy and practice from George Washington University, as well as an M.A. in Asia-Pacific Studies 
and a BA in International Relations from Foreign Affairs College in Beijing. And she has an extensive background in Chinese foreign policy, US-China relations, and China's relationship with neighboring countries and other communities. And I'd like to thank her. Thank you. Thank you, Harry. Well, thank you very much for the invitation to be here. Um, a special, a special thanks to Josh and Anne for having me here as this uh, as a series. Uh, Josh said most of the speakers are top people. I'm not a top person. I'm only a tall person, <laughs> but I will try to. Um, try to present you with some of the research I have done on China-North Korea relations. And I know there are a lot of talents and expertise in this room, so I look forward to hearing your views and learning from your expertise as well. So uh, the alliance between China and North Korea. As you might have already known, being, being informed that yesterday North Korea had a new round of uh, missile test. And this time what it tested is uh, Hosan 15 Hosan 15, and it arguably has the capability, or at least according to the North Korean government statement, it has the capability to reach continental United States. So far, North Korea has conducted six nuclear tests, one in 2006, one in 2009, one in 2013, two in 2016, and another one this past September. But the missile test this time is slightly different because it happened after President Trump's visit to China. And we know that prior to his visit, North Korea and trade have been labeled as top two issues that he would seek a resolution or seek consensus with Chinese leader Xi Jinping. And this test also happened after Xi Jinping, Chinese president's special envoy, the head of uh, Chinese Communist Party's international department, Song Tao, paid a visit to Pyongyang. And presumably people were speculating that Song Tao was conveying messages about the consensus and discussion between Xi Jinping and Trump during Trump's visit to Beijing. So there have been a lot of expectations about whether and how China would be changing North Korea's behavior. Now Trump has been to China. But unfortunately, I think people now have been disappointed. So there's a question that people ask that why the North Korea situation has become so tense this year. North Korea has been trying to develop nuclear weapons for decades. And 11 years have passed since their first nuclear test. So why is this here? Why is this so contentious? Those are primar primarily two two change the factors here. We look at the, the changing variables and the unchanging variables. There are two changed variables here. The first one is, uh, of course, Trump's presidency and Trump's new priority sense of prioritization attached to the North Korea threat to the United States. And there has been a change of uh, policy methods or appro approaches towards North Korea. Trump administration has been pursuing this hyper pressure or highly coercive diplomacy towards North Korea, combined with some back channel diplomacy and back channel engagement. Uh, Trump administration has more than once committed that all options are on the table, including the military options. So that approach has stimulated North Korea to react to, um, to a U.S. policy. The other changing or change the variable for North Korea, from the North Korea side is the, pro the progress North Korea has made towards its uh, ICBM capability, the intercontinental ballistic missile capability. As North Korea makes progress towards the credible ICBM capability, North Korea is very close to getting the capability to hit United States, uh, continental United States with a nuclear weapon. So therefore, as the threat level enhances, the reaction and the policy approaches from the United States and US military allies in the region have also been intensified. One feature of uh, President Trump's policy towards North Korea is the emphasis on China. That China is the key to the solution of North Korea problem because China is North Korea's ally and China is also the largest and the most important supporter of North Korea, not only through trade investment, aid, but also through the political protection China provides to North Korea. So since uh, we are um, we're so frequently discussing the fact that China and North Korea are allies, 
What is the nature of this alliance relationship? Do we have the do we have the accurate understanding of how these two allies stand on their foreign policy? Because uh, you will hear, and you probably have heard, these questions about this alliance. What kind of allies pursue their own nuclear weapon without even consulting their allies? And what kind of allies instigate regional instability against the warning and against the consult from their from their military ally. So apparently there is something different about this alliance relationship from the traditional alliances that we discuss. So let's look a little bit at how this alliance was formed and how this alliance has, has evolved throughout the history. So the formation of the Sino-North Korea alliance happened during the Korean War. A little bit of history. The Korean Peninsula has been ruled, had been ruled by Japan since the uh, year of 1910, which lasted to the end of the World War II. In the August of 1945, Soviet Union declared a war on Japan. And after the Japanese surrender, Soviet Union and the United States reached an agreement to, to divide the Korean Peninsula according to the 38th parallel. And in 1948, two governments, two independent sovereign governments were formed, one in the north and one in the south. And they both believed, that, and they both still believe, that they are the only and so legitimate government to represent the interest of the whole Korean people, therefore to represent the whole Korean Peninsula. And they both claim sovereignty over the whole Korean Peninsula and refuse to recognize the legality of the other regime on the other side of the 38th parallel. So in, two, uh, in the June 25th, on June 25th of 1950, North Korea used self-defense as the excuse to cross the 38th parallel and attack South Korea. And this is of, oftentimes regarded as the, as the beginning of the Korean War. And at the earlier stage of the Korean War, the North Korean army had the advantage. And the South Korean army will push the southwards continuously until by basically within three months, the South North Korean army was surrounding Seoul. But after US landing in Incheon, the situation rapidly deteriorated for North Korea. And Kim Yo san had to turn to China and turn to the Soviet Union for assistance. So China's initial judgment is that if this is a civil war between North Korea and South Korea, then China doesn't have the ground to intervene. But after the American intervention, the Chinese draw the conclusion that the UN army to interfere in the Korean War is not aimed at the restoration of the pre-war division of the Korean Peninsula according to the 38th parallel. And that's when the Chinese government issued a warning to the, UN, to the UN army that if they cross the 38th parallel into the north, then China's neutrality could change in this, uh, in this case. And what happened in the following months is that the Chinese began to accuse the UN army for invading into the Chinese territorial uh, Chinese space and for um, of bombing Chinese territories. So this is eventually led to the Chinese decision to send the Chinese People's Volunteer Army into the Korean Peninsula, mm -hmm. followed by three years of a bloody war and eventually led to the armistice of the Korean War. So the general perception in China is that the alliance between China and North Korea started with the Korean War. But it was not until eight years later that the two sides signed the agreement that nailed down or consolidated their alliance relationship. And this, was an, uh, this is a treaty called Sino-North Korea Treaty of Friendship, Cooperation, and Mutual Assistance. So interesting, um, interesting article of this, uh, or um, interesting conditions for this treaty is that this treaty was signed in 1961. And this, the stipulation is that this treaty will automatically renew itself every 20 years. So this treaty was renewed automatically in 1981, and then again in 2001. So the next renewal if there's no change to the plan, will happen in the September of 2021. That's about three years later. 
So according to this, uh, to this treaty, China carries major international obligation for, for North Korea. So if we look at the Article 2 of the treaty, the Article 2 says that the two sides of this treaty will ensure, will promise that they will jointly take all measures to prevent any country's invasion or aggression towards one of the treaty members. And if one member of the treaty is under the military attack by one or several foreign countries, the other party is obligated to provide military assistance and other assistance to the full capacity that it could. And the Article 3 of this treaty also stipulates that the, the Two parties of this treaty will not join any actions or measures by any foreign parties that's aimed or have an impact over the other over the other party. So the Chinese believe that since the signing of this treaty, the Chinese feel that well, this treaty has uh, well, although I think it's the Chinese propaganda, um, this treaty has pr protected the peace and stability of the region because the treaty provides a deterrence against another invasion or another Korean War. But at the same time, the Chinese also recognize, not only internally, but also externally, outside China, that this treaty has protected North Korea from international obligations or from international punishment for its nuclear development. So now when we discuss this treaty and its automatic renewal in 2021, the question is that, is the treaty going to be renewed? Well, the problem with the treaty's um, language is that for any change to be made about the renewal, the two parties have to have a consensus. So both China and North Korea will have to agree to anything that's going to change to this, to this treaty, including its renewal. And apparently North Korea is not going to agree to it. So the Chinese policy community has been trying to develop, develop some extra conditions or some extra explanations for the Chinese potential negligence or potential revoke of this treaty. For example, some of the Chinese analysts would argue that if a war or if a military conflict in North Korea was a result of North Korean military provocation, the so North Korea will have negated its commitment to peace and stability stipulated in this treaty to begin with. And since the precondition is already gone, then the China does not have the, have the obligation to fulfill its uh, treaty obligation. The question here is that, so if we look at the effect of the Sino-North Korea alliance, if this alliance has been really effective and China provides a kind of deterrence and China provides a kind of protection that North Korea requires, why would North Korea develop nuclear weapons? That's a key question. Because since the treaty already protects North Korea, North Korea has no reason to develop its own nuclear weapons. So this since the North Koreans have been pursuing its uh, nuclear weapons, as we know, according to the uh, to evidence that, that's in record, North Korea pursuit of nuclear weapons started to accelerate in 1993. Then we have to ask the question that what is the authenticity of this alliance relationship? And what is the effectiveness of this alliance relationship? And when we look at this issue, we will, have, we will realize that Sino-North Korea alliance has encountered many problems since a long time ago. So to go to the very beginning, the Korean War. The Korean War in China has been perceived as an example of North Korean manipulation and coercion of China into a corner that China does not have a, cannot back out of. And it's perceived as North Korea using China to subject the China's national interest to the, what the Chinese would say, selfish consideration and selfish national interest of the North Koreans. Because in 1950, before June of 1950, North Korean then, then North Korean leader Kim Il-sung visited both Moscow and Beijing, demanding Soviet and Chinese support for his campaign against South Korea. <laughs> and both Soviet Union and China said no, that we have other priorities, we don't want you to take this action at this time. And for China, the top priority at that time is the issue of Taiwan. 
that Chairman Mao was was making up plans to unify China to take back Taiwan uh, from the KMT government. So China certainly had other priorities to be concerned with and did not want to see the Korean War distracting most of the Chinese attention. But what happened later was that Kim Yong-sang knew that once he starts a war, China and Soviet Union would not be able to stand aside. So he started the Korean War without the consent from either Beijing or Moscow. And this, in the Chinese policy interpretation, in the Chinese policy community, has resulted in China losing almost permanently, and we will see, permanently losing the, the ability to have nation, national unification with Taiwan. And this is very much entirely blamed on the North Korean selfish moves. So this is so, so from the very beginning of this alliance there have been problems. And in the 1970s, the divergence of China's foreign policy priority and the North Korean foreign policy priority resulted in bigger problems between the two allies. We know that after 1972, China has been pursuing this normalization of relationship with the United States. And China had identified the Soviet Union as the biggest threat to China's national security. So this split between China and Russia um, and Soviet Union resulted in a very different orientation of the Chinese foreign policy. But at the same time, North Korea still maintains very close relationship with Soviet Union, hoping to manipulate the Soviet Union and China against each other. So what happened was uh, from this point on, when China started to pursue normalization of relations with the United States, North Korea began to see China as a problem. Because in the North Korea foreign policy lexicon, United States is the reason that North Korea has not been able to unify the whole Korean Peninsula. And the United States is the biggest threat to the national security of North Korea. When China developed a different perception about, about the United States, uh, that put China and North, uh, North Korea in a very different, different courses um, of foreign policy. So that's uh, that's the diplomatic differences, foreign policy differences between Beijing and Pyongyang. There's also a problem, um, or also a differences in terms of the ideology, especially since 1970s. We know that during the Cultural Revolution, China pursued this revolutionary foreign policy where China export revolutionary um, ideology to other developed, uh, developing countries. But after the uh, Cultural Revolution, or sometime around 1972, because of China's relationship with the United States was improving, and China's relationship with the Soviet Union kept deteriorating, China abandoned the export of revolution policy. So when Kim Yo-sun visited Beijing in 1975, he was hoping to get Beijing's support, because what happened in 1975? The Viet Cong united Vietnam. And when North Korea looked at their Korean Peninsula, they felt that we need to make a push. That now Vietnam is a unified country, and how come we're not being allowed and we're not being supported to take over South Korea? So in 1975, he made a trip to Beijing, trying to convince Mao Zedong that you need to support us in our military campaign against, against South Korea. And Mao Zedong said no. And the conclusion Kim Yong-sun drew from that trip is that China has lost its revolutionary motivation. That the flag of the world revolution is no longer being carried by China. And North Korea developed this, uh, this, this hope or this intention that the center of the world revolution should be moving from Beijing to Pyongyang to North Korea. And the center of Marxism-Leninism is also should be moving from China to North Korea. This is why after 1977 and 1978, if we look at the content of the Juche ideology of North Korea, it, has it, it began to change. And North Korea started to describe itself as a leader of the world revolution. And the China has already abandoned this revolutionary ideology. And in particular, China did not support North Korea to pursue revolution in South Korea and did not support a second Korean War. So this is ideological differences that had emerged between China and North Korea since the 1970s. And 
In 1980s, evolving forward, more problems evolved between, happened, emerged between China and North Korea because in 1979, China began to adopt its policy of reform and opening up, spearheaded by the economic reform of the country, right? And Deng Xiaoping had this famous saying that regardless of the, whether the cat is black or white, as, a, as long as it can catch mouse, it's a good cat. And translate. <laughs> so what Deng Xiaoping was trying to say is regardless of whether we are a communist country, or we're a socialist country, we're a capitalist country, if we can promote economic growth inside China, then we are a good country and we are a good government. So when China marched on towards market economy, this had a direct impact over the economic relations between China and North Korea. Because in the past, under this alliance, alliance framework, North Korea had been demanding China to deliver food, deliver energy, deliver steel, deliver weapons, all for free. But now China has become more market oriented. The Chinese government began to ask questions, why should we why should we provide everything for free to the North Koreans? We also need to make money. Our military factories also need contracts. So this creates problem between um, China and North Korea because so for example in nineteen eighty three the so North Koreans sent 100 planes that Mao Zedong gave to North Korea about 10 years later, telling the Chinese that we want you to repair them for me, do the maintenance work. And the Chinese said that, okay, so how much you're gonna pay us to do the maintenance work? And the North Koreans said, these were given to us by Chairman Mao, how dare you ask us for money? And the Chinese said, well, but you know, we're having this reform, we have a market economy, so we cannot do this for free. So that's where the North Koreans felt that for the Chinese ally, money is more important than the alliance relationship. And that further dampened any of the momentum to consolidate this, uh, this alliance relations. And the last straw happened in 1992. Remember that we talked about the North Korean started to expedite their <laughs> nuclear development in 1993. So the last straw that damaged the alliance relationship was in 1992, China established diplomatic relations with South Korea. And the specific foreign policy context of China's decision to do that is that in 1989, China had the Tiananmen massacre, and China was rapidly put under international sanctions and international isolations, and China was very desperate to seek foreign policy friends internationally. And at this time, when South Korea expressed willingness to di establish diplomatic relations with China, China jumped on it. But this has completely disappointed North Korea. Because the North Korea feel that you are my ally, then you should be on my side, and I do not recognize South Korea as a legitimate government. Now you have established diplomatic relations with my mortal enemy, and how could we still be allies? And this sense of profound disappointment led to this profound sense of distrust and profound sense of vulnerability and insecurity. And this is a core reason or the central reason why North Korea is developing nuclear, wep nuclear weapons. South Korea has had its economic takeoff, its economic victory, and the United States has never, um, has not yet reached out to North Koreans for diplomatic normalization. So literally, although there is the armistice, literally the state, the Korean Peninsula is still in a state of war because the war has never been ended with a peace treaty. And for the North Koreans to see the toppling of the regime by Gaddafi and by Saddam, those all raises a sense of insecurity in North Korea that regime change will eventually come to their country. So this is also the core, the key reason why North Korea develop, develops its nuclear weapons. People in DC always ask that is North Korea a rational player? <laughs> Are they rational? Because we have seen so much brinkmanship, North Korea pushing the envelope, willing to risk war or military conflict, but are they rational? I think most of the analysts would agree that North Korea is irrational and it is willing to take calculated risk to push the brinkmanship to get what it wants. And with the nuclear capability, if we think about the North Korean behavior, 
the North Koreans most likely, well, we cannot really assume what North Koreans are thinking, but most of the analysts would assume that North Korea is not trying to develop a nuclear weapon to use that on any country. Because if that happens, then that would be suicidal. And North Korea's nuclear arsenal is nowhere near a competition with that of the United States. So most of the people would argue that North Korea wants to have deterrence. They want to have the capability to counterattack if they are under attack by the United States or its, or its military allies. And to solve this problem, China also missed a significant chance in the 1990s where there was a proposal being discussed that China could provide a nuclear umbrella to North Korea in order to stop North Korea from developing their own nuclear weapons. But at that time, China was not willing to provide the nuclear umbrella. So now, nowadays, a lot of Chinese officials feel that was an opportunity that was missed because China could have stopped any, any of this from happening. Coming back to the Sino-North Korea alliance, why does North Korea's nuclear development hurt China's national interest? There are many reasons, but to name a few, 75% of North Korea's nuclear facility are located within 100 kilometers of the Sino-North Korea border. So if there is going to be a nuclear fallout, say if North Korea has another nuclear weapons, their tunnel the, where they conduct the nuclear test has already collapsed after the September test because of the, uh, the tonnage of the, uh, of the test. So if there's any nuclear fallout, from any of these sites, the Chinese border or the Chinese land and Chinese soil will be the first one to be subject to the contamination of the, radi of the radiation. And the, the concern of the Chinese government is well reflected every time North Korea has a nuclear test. The Chinese Environmental Protection Ministry enhances its uh, monitoring of the air quality and the radiation of the region adjacent to the, uh, to the North Korean border. That's the first reason. A second reason from the Chinese government's point of view, North Korea developing nuclear weapons only gives the United States and its milita military alliance more legitimacy to be in the region. And this has literally had the effect to strengthen America's military presence in the, in the region. And if North Korea's calculated risk turns out to be wrong, that they miscalculated, or they were misinformed, or there was a miscommunication or skirmish that lead to a real military conflict, this will create war on China's periphery and a war that most likely, according to the treaty obligation, China will have to step in. And last but not least, the nuclear development by North Korea dilutes the membership of the nuclear club. And for the Chinese as a, for, for China as a member of the of the P5, and one of the five powers with a legitimate claim or the legitimate ability to, to own nuclear weapons, China does not want to see this uh, mem nuclear membership being diluted by any country, be it Iran or be it North Korea. So what has North Korea's nuclear development um, what are the impact of this nuclear development by North Korea upon the alliance of North, between North Korea and China? So first of all, China always feels that North Korea is this, this, this headache, this diplomatic liability, although not, a, not necessarily a strategic liability, a diplomatic liability because China is the ally and China is the largest support of North Korea. Whenever North Korea does some tests, missile tests or nuclear tests, the international community will hold China responsible. They will demand China to take actions to rein in North Korea. And as a result, China has been um, has been carrying pressure and also unilateral sanctions by, for example, the United States. And China does not enjoy that kind of pressure. And we also see that the Chinese Foreign Ministry always emphasize that, well, China and North Korea, we, are, we have a normal country-to-country -country relationship. But then if you use that code and ask PLA or ask the International Department of the Communist Party, they're going to say that, yeah, it's a normal state to say the relationship. And that's the diplomatic rhetoric. And how could this relationship be normal? That we have carried North Korea for decades. We have lost our chance of national unification because of what they did. And we have been paying for their regime survival for decades. 
So how could this be a normal state-to-state -state relations? So there's uh, this interesting different perception or uh, rhetoric outside China and also the internal perception. And last but not least, China is extremely concerned that, that North Korea's nuclear development will eventually drag China into a second Korean War with the United States. And for China, they feel that we, we, we got this game pretty good, that we are developing our economy, we can compete with the United States with our, with our international influence. We don't want to end up in another war with the Americans, and it's not worth our while. So there's uh, this major concern or this major stressor for the alliance relationship, which is that uh, North Korea is so steadfast on its own selfish development or pursuit of absolute national security, and China is paying the price for it. So next question is why China is not, why is China not abandoning North Korea? We have made a lot of arguments that China should see it's not in your interest, they are diluting your nuclear membership, it's bad for your soil, it raises the concern of your people, and they are ingrate. They do not take into heart, they do not into take, take into consideration the national interest of China at all, so why are you not abandoning North Korea? And that's the question and the argument that we have been making to the Chinese for decades, well, at least two decades. And that's it, where the conversation between the United States and China get really interesting. So Chinese will say that, well, you know, North Korea have their security concerns, and I think we think that their security concern is legitimate. That they are a regime, they are a country legally recognized by the United Nations. They have UN represent, representation. So why should they be subject to this regime change or this vulnerability or this insecurity? Why don't you talk to the North Koreans and have a conversation about your diplomatic normalization? And then we will say that no, 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 we have a, as a matter of principle, we cannot work with, uh, with countries who use nuclear blackmail to get what they want. And we also have our South Korean allies that we need to be considerate of. But for the Chinese, when they look at North Korea, is North Korea a strategic liability? In the past 20 years, North Korea has increasingly become a strategic liability that forces China repeatedly into a corner with the international community. But the Chinese question is that, is North Korea still a strategic asset? And when they look at the security power balance, balance of power in Northeast Asia, they realize that, well, U.S. has military alliance with Japan, and U.S. has military alliance with South Korea. And what do we have? We have a North Korea that's not even loyal to our national interest. So when we look at the scenario of a North Korean collapse, most likely it will result in the unification of the Korean Peninsula. And the Chinese then draw their conclusion, in that scenario, we're going to face the with the consequence where the Americans will maintain their military alliance with South Korea and the military alliance will be extended to the north of the 38th parallel right to the Chinese border. So when the Chinese do their calculation, they thought that, well, North Korea is a liability, but it's also a strategic asset. And in most cases so far, the calculation in China, as I checked on Monday, <laughs> I came back from China on Monday, <laughs> the calculation still is that North Korea is more an asset than a liability for, China, for China's strategic interests. So when they talk to the South Koreans and when they talk to Americans, the Chinese argument is that you know what we really want. You know that we really want to see the North Korean problem being solved, but we also need an end game that we can aspire for. We also need a scenario in the future that we will be reassured that the demise of the North Korean regime does not mean the demise of any Chinese influence on the Korean Peninsula. So that's what the Chinese really want to negotiate 
with, uh, with the United States and its allies. And the Chinese has raised this issue with South Koreans, and South Koreans' re reaction is that, of course, we can, we can negotiate on that. Once we have the national unification, we don't have to have American troops to the north of the 38th parallel, and we don't have to have the continuation of our military alliance with the United States. And the Chinese tell the South Koreans that, of course, it's easy for you to say, but it also doesn't count. So we need you and your ally to tell us what is going to happen after the unification of the Korean Peninsula. And we need to be assured that the consequence of that scenario is not going to put China's national interest in jeopardy. So that is the most difficult question to, to answer at this point. And for the Chinese, they are not going to change their current policy on North Korea until they see that coming. So where do we go from here? What about the future unification of the Korean Peninsula? What's going to happen to the, to the South Korean government's aspiration to have the unifica unification? The Chinese actually recognize that unification of the Korean Peninsula is the future. It's going to happen. It's just a matter of when it is going to happen. And so from a from a legal perspective or from a moralistic perspective, the Chinese has been arguing for their own national unification with, with Taiwan. So for China to oppose the unification of the Korean Peninsula is against China's own argument. But the Chinese will say that we have conditions for the Korean Peninsula's unification. And the two conditions, that unification have to be one, independent. Two, it has, has to be peaceful. So what does that mean, independent? And that's where the relationship between South Korea and the United States comes into play, that it has to be independent, therefore free of external factors or external involvement. And that means that China will not play a role in the unification, and the United States should not play a role in the unification. And the unification also has to be peaceful. So it cannot be based on a military action by the South Koreans to, to move over to the north of the uh, 38th parallel and just take it over. And the South Koreans will have to give China an answer well, about who will be dominant in the, in, the in the Korean Peninsula after the unification. And this agreement cannot be a bilateral agreement. It has to, has ex it has to have external guarantee in the form of either an international treaty or in the form of a UN agreement. So how to achieve those goals? <laughs> There's a couple of there are a couple of options. The first one, which is the Chinese preferred option, is for North Korea to adopt economic reform and opening up. And that's why the Chinese have taken have brought Kim Jong Un's father to China multiple times to Shandong province, to Guangdong province, to Shenzhen to show him that you don't have to be um, you don't have to be democratic to be legitimate. Look at China. China is an authoritarian state. It has drawn its legitimacy from the performance of the Chinese government. If you can improve your economy, if you can improve the living conditions of your people and provide better lives for your people, then you can claim legitimacy. That is a path that China has been uh, persuading North Korea to take, but North Korea has refused so far. And coming to the issue of unification, the Chinese believe that this, uh, this economic reform as manifest, uh, manifested in the relationship between China and Taiwan is that uh, China's economy has grown so much. It has been able to integrate the Taiwanese economy into the mainland economy so much that at least Taiwan is not able to declare independence. That the Taiwanese businesses and government needs to consider not only the military consequence, but also the economic consequences of their, of their behavior. So that's what the Chinese call the, China, the Taiwan model for economic integration eventually lead to more integration in the political atmosphere. And that's the model that they want South Korea and North Korea to pursue. The second model is what the Chinese call the German model. And it's basically the collapse of uh, East Germany and West Germany just took over based on absorption. And that's a model that South Korea prefers. Although there is an intriguing question on who is going to pay for it. 
<laughs> because it would be very expensive. And South Korea apparently is uh, is either well, it's both unable and unwilling to carry that financial liability. That's a German model. And there's a, a third option, which is a contingency-based change of regime in North Korea. This won't necessarily lead to the unification of the Korean Peninsula, but it would address the issue of nuclearization of uh, North Korea. And this model goes as this. In this scenario, for the Chinese calculation, they see North Korea as a strategic asset. So there is a distinction to be made between North Korea as a country and the North Korean government as a regime. So for China to maintain a strategic asset, it only needs the North Korean government, North Korean the country to be around, but it does not have to be led by the same government. So if it comes to it, if it comes to the point where the Kim's family regime pushes attention to the breaking point, there have been proposals circulated in China that China should promote it a peaceful, well, not necessarily peaceful, but promote a regime change in North Korea to make sure the new regime in North Korea will be pro-China and nuclear free. So that would eliminate any ground or any reason or any legitimacy for US and South Korea to invade North Korea in order to pursue the unification. And this would be in line with the alliance relationship in the Chinese definition. Although in this scenario, this will not lead to a near future unification of the Korean Peninsula. But whether we find that acceptable is um, subject to debate. So I will stop there. Thank you very much for your patience. And I look forward to the discussion. <laughs> Questions, sir? What, what you just discussed really um, if I were Kim Jong Il sitting here, I would say no matter what I do, whether I want to take over or what the Chinese want, I'm out. Therefore, I ought to make more nuclear weapons because the more I have mm. and the more threatening I am, the less opportunity there will be to depose me because the Chinese want to depose me, the South Koreans want to depose me. any kind of real solution when we have put this guy in a box mm -hmm. and said you're a loser you're out no matter what happens you're out well what well, the Chinese are arguing that the North Koreans feel that they don't have any chance of sustaining their regime if they if they do not have nuclear weapons. So this is the essential, the last guarantee of not only the regime survival, but also the survival of the Kim's family. So that's why they have to keep developing nuclear weapons and to show the world that they have deterrence. And one, I'm not sure if it's comparable, but one example that people do discuss is that let's look at the countries in the world with nuclear capability or with nuclear weapons, but without the legitimacy to do so. So there's Israel, there we say, there's India, and there's Pakistan. So India and Pakistan both developed their nuclear weapons in 1998. They are not members of NPT, and they, their nuclear programs are not necessarily subject to the safeguards of the IAEA or the international supervision. So how do we deal with that? Of course, we have a more friendly views of India, but in the case of Pakistan, how do we negotiate a way out with a nuclear Pakistan? So it is not like this has never been done before. I think the bigger question is, are we willing to do it? If we see in North Korea that we know it is an evil regime, it conducts all sorts of human rights violations, but at the same time they're using nuclear blackmail to get us, to force us to deliver what they want, including a diplomatic normalization, they want a peace mechanism. Some of the North Korean officials even talked about compensation because um, American imperialists have put, have put North Korea under the sanctions and isolations for so many years, and North Korean poor people have suffered this tremendous economic loss throughout the years. So for the North Koreans, they certainly have a list of things that they want to 
extract from from the United States. And the only way that they see that they can do it is through nuclear blackmail. Mm -hmm. But then that gets back to the the most essential question. There's Military option is not good, although maybe they cannot f hit continental United States, but they can definitely inflict, inflict tremendous loss and casualties on our allies. And negotiation raises a question, the moral question, that is it moral to negotiate with, uh, with a regime like North Korea? And we can also resort to the Chinese proposal. The Chinese would say that, well, first of all, why don't you have a double suspension? You can suspend your mil joint military exercise with South Korea in exchange for North Korea to suspend their nuclear and missile tests. So that's not a way to solve the problem, but ostensibly it will de-escalate the tension for the time being. Although the North Koreans said that they're not interested in that proposal. <laughs> that's a problem. So coming to North Korea, I would say there's no good solution. Um, I think the Chinese, among all the countries in the world, China has the largest influence over North Korea. That influence may not be enough to change the nuclear decisions or the decision to pursue nuclear weapons and maintain nuclear weapons by North Korea. But they do have the largest influence over, over that country. But to work with China, like Dr. Kissinger would say that we need a grand bargain. We need a grand bargain with China so that the Chinese will work with us and we can work together on the threat from, from North Korea. But then that raises a difficult question that if we look into the next 30 years or 20 years, who is the biggest threat to American national interest? And when we look at the Chinese way of their expansionist foreign policy, when we look at the push for the China model across the world, we look at the China's economic coercion, for example, on South Korea, when South Korea wants to develop, a, deploy a missile defense system for their own national interest. And when we look at this geopolitical threat from any country, I would say that China represents a bigger problem for the United States in the long run. So are we willing to make a deal with China simply because North Korea is more acute threat to our national security? I think these questions have no answers. <laughs> so sorry, I can only tell you what's, what's going on. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Hi, thank you for your uh, presentation. The solution for North Korea. And the solution is the end of geopolitics. The solution is the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, which nations around the world are joining right now because mm. the key thing is that the geopolitics that has shaped uh, the conditions within the Korean Peninsula, the war drive, uh, such as what has been promoted yeah. with the former, uh, adopted by former President Pak Geun-hye. Sure. And you look at the situation, which that has not come up, is now you have a situation where the current President Jay um, it's now saying that he doesn't want to have a war and bad relations. I think the key thing right now is the initiative that's underway with the friendship that was developed by President Trump, which the media in the United States is not talking about, and President Xi Jinping, and also the relationship to the world right now with the um, with the Belt and Road, the New Silk Road Initiative, is key to peace. So if North Korea can realize that their future lies as all this economic development, which is centered in the new paradigm of the Belt and Road, away from the geopolitics of a war strategy. So I, there is a solution, and then you'd like to comment on that. Well, that's certainly a lovely, well, a, 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 a great proposal, and I would love for the North Korean stream yeah, that well, economic development is the key to their survival. That's what the Chinese have been trying to convince them of since the year 1997 or the year 2000, since they beginning to began to bring Kim Jong Il to China to see the great achievement. 
um, North Korea has this policy called Byongjin. So it's basically a parallel pursuit of economic development on one hand and nuclearization on the other hand. That has been basically written into their constitution. That's their national strategy coming to their national security and national development. So being in the parallel pursuit sounds like a great idea, that on one hand, they can protect their security. On the other hand, they can pursue the economic development. But there is one fundamental problem, which is that these two goals are not compatible. For them to pursue nuclear, wep nuclear weapons, the international community, especially the UN Security Council, have to respond to that. And every time they conduct a nuclear test or a ballistic intercontinental ballistic missile test, UN Security Council has, has to come up with more sanction resolutions. It's not going to change their mind. It's not going to suddenly have the effect of North Korea realizing that, oh, wow, we're under so much sanctions because of a nuclear program, we're going to give it up. They're not going to give it up. But it's a matter of principle. It's a matter of position by the international community to, sh to tell North Korea that this kind of behavior is wrong, and no country should follow suit. So the result of the sanctions is that North Korea cannot pursue their de economic development as, as they want to. And they do not have the luxury to have normal trade relations with the rest of the world however much they would like to they would like to have that and if we look at the belt and the road initiative belt and the road initiative a lot of that is spearheaded by this chinese investment or chinese funded infrastructure projects in another country that is forbidden by un security council resolutions so I, I agree with you. I think eventually it would be great if North Koreans could change their perception and the, see, the, see the argument that they don't need nuclear weapons to, to be legit or to protect their national security. But uh, just, I'm afraid that so far they're not at that state yet. So let's keep fingers crossed. <laughs> yes, sir. So far you've been talking about China's strategy, North Korea's strategy. What should the American strategy be different than what it is now? Should we back off like we did back in the 90s and uh, let, let Korea keep going? Mm. What, what's your thought? Where should we go? I think to answer the question, there's a bigger question, which is what does the U.S. want? And knowing that we cannot get everything we want, what are we willing to sacrifice? What, what are we willing to trade? That's, that's universal for all the foreign policy decisions. But what should we give up? Well, if we believe that denuclearization is the, is the supreme goal, and we're willing to sacrifice all other national interests for the denuclearization of, uh, of, of North Korea, then maybe Dr. Kissinger is right. We need a grand bargain with China. But if we see that our supreme goal is to maintain our geopolitical presence in that region and consolidate that, that, that presence, and in the future our biggest threat is China, then I would say that we need to think about other options that can maximize our ability to counter China's rise in that region. But you cannot have both. Oh, I'm sorry. Is there a comment? Please. Yeah. No, no, I was just oh, saying, that's going to happen. You're not going to talk to China's rising. I mean, China is emerging as the most powerful nation right now. The key thing is to get the United States to join with the, that initiative, uh, with the Belt and Road, and with the mm. emerging power of China. Well, to understand, I think to deconstruct the emerging power of China is a very complicated issue. It depends on what kind of, uh, what kind of world you want to... Um, you want to envision. For example, the Chinese said that, okay, we're going to have a trade with you, we're going to invest in your country, but we also want you to pay deference to the issues that we see as important. So if there is a conflict between your national interest and my, and I'm, I'm investing in your country, then you need to listen to me. Yeah, that's <laughs> so, and also we know that China, China has been cracking, well, 
suppressing its own civil society organizations. It calls for the democratization of international relations, but the only reason or the biggest reason for that is China is not the most powerful country in the world. So I sometimes I, I try to imagine what if China is the uh, most powerful country in the world, and China does not have this United States as uh, this, this, this devil in their minds that's constantly threatening China's regime legitimacy and its survival. And I try to think what kind of world that will be. And earlier this year, um, there was this poll in, uh, in the Indo-Pacific to look at the favorable feelings towards China and towards the United States. And the data from Australia was really shocking. So 73% of Australians see China as a future dominant power in the Indo-Pacific. And 67% of Australians interviewed in that, in that poll have this affinity, this favorable feelings towards, towards China than any other countries in, in, the, in the region. And we were having this, this panel in DC about what that means, right? And one, one panelist made a comment that, doesn't Australians know what kind of world that will be? That China is not, also, is not a democratic country in their country, and you think China will be a democratic power when they come to international politics or world affairs? You don't think that China will use coercion, both diplomatic and military and economic, to force other countries' hand? Is that a... Is that, a, is, that, is that a system that we want to live in? But then again, I'm sure people can have different opinions. Shall we move on? I just want to say we had a talk here by a job candidate oh. speaking specifically about these issues. Great. Uh, she, uh, she was talking about bullying in Chinese uh, foreign policy behavior, and that's online. So uh, <laughs> she's speaking specifically to the issue uh, of uh, Chinese behavior towards weaker powers versus stronger powers. So I think that was a good talk. Uh, to, to Thank you. So sorry, sir, I don't have the answer to your question. <laughs> but again, food for thought. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Um, my question is, to, um, what role do you think South Korea hosting the Olympics in February will have on regional relations, regional security, the tension when the entire world descends on South Korea? Oh, that's a shivering question. It's like when President Trump said that I want to go to the DMZ. <laughs> <laughs> And he did try, and the weather that morning was not was not cooperating, so he didn't go in the end. But a lot of people were relieved that he didn't go. <laughs> um, well, what kind of effect is that going to have? I think the most immediate effect is that um, the South Koreans were very eager to improve their relationship with China because uh, they weren't able to sell a lot of the tickets for their Olympics, both because of the geopolitical risk and also because uh, China was putting that economic sanction on South Korea. So now the relationship is improved. I don't know whether there will be more Chinese purchase of the Olympic tickets. Um, sending the Chinese tourists to, to, to South Korea. But coming to what's going to happen next February, North Korea has a habit of uh, provoking, having some sort of test during events that they see as important. For example, US and South Korea are going to have joint military exercise very soon, and we saw a missile test yesterday. And when the Chinese hosted the BRICS summit in Fujian province, North Korea responded with a nuclear test. Um, and that was not received kindly. So I, I would not be surprised if North Korea seeks to provoke or to express their anger before the, uh, the Olympic Games. But I hope, I hope that will not generate a real um, attack. I don't think they will attack. Yeah, I think it's more of a, a gesture that we want to make the world know that we're not happy about this. Yes, sir. Uh, on that point, it strikes me that uh, multiple countries could look at, at, at a single action. Mm. Some see it as provocative, some see it as preemptive, some see it as self-defense. Is there a generally accepted definition for what, you know, when, when you go from one definition to another? Uh, preventative, preemptive, and defensive uh, or offensive. Yeah. I don't think there's a consensus on that. 
I think the Chinese would like to argue that, oh, well, it's self-defense, and Russia is very much in support of that argument. I've had discussions with Russian scholars who argue that, well, why are you threatening the poor North Korean regime survival? That you are the biggest threat, don't you see? Don't, don't you see that how, how could North Korea threat your national security of the United States? So it's all one way. I, I don't think that is true. I think the North Koreans certainly have a vulnerability. They have a security concern. But that the security concern justifies the kind of provocation that they have, uh, they have staged. Um, and I don't think so. But there's no consensus. And the US would argue that we will negotiate with you if you are committed to denuclearization. But then again, record and history is not on our side because no country who has ever achieved nuclear capability has ever given it up. So then the question is if we know that denuclearization is unlikely or unattainable, what do we do from there? Do we de-escalate our goal and pursue peace, stability, or lack of provocation from North Korea as, us, as our goal? Or we continue our goal, continue to pursue the goal of denuclearization at the risk of North Korea keep, prov keep provoking? Yes, sir. To follow up to that, using the word provocation for sure. Korean behavior, um, is it is it potentially detrimental to U.S. or foreign policy in trying to understand and shape appropriate responses to North Korean behavior if all North Korean behavior is called provocation? Because provocation basically mm -hmm. sounds like you're walking into a bar, punching someone in the face, and trying to get into a fight. Mm -hmm. but if the U.S. which tests um, nuclear capable ICBMs every single year multiple times in line mm. tests all the way out to the Pacific. No warhead, but tests flying missiles. That's not per perceived or shaped in U.S. media as provocation. Mm -hmm. But if the North Koreans test a military capacity, it's called provocation. Mm -hmm. Doesn't that doesn't that lead to uh, misanalysis within uh, the U.S. side and how they define what the North Koreans are doing and what are viable steps to manage? Mm -hmm. There are two answers. Um, that's a good question. That's a good point. If the U.S. can do it, why North Korea cannot do it? Why are we saying that there are different standards being applied to the United States and other countries who have similar national security pursuit? There are two reasons. First of all, it's NPT. It's a non-proliferation treaty. We are a member. North Korea dropped out. And we still say that even if you drop out, we're still going to hold you accountable for the NPT obligation. But then that's, a, uh, that's an argument that we make. And the second reason is there's no U.N. Security Council resolution against U.S. testing its missiles in the middle of the Pacific. But, but, but I'm not asking the legality of mm -hmm. the North Korean behavior. I'm asking about the use of the word provocation. Because the use of the specific mm -hmm. word provocation, which is used all the time for anything the North Koreans do, yeah. I think is a very misleading word. Because I think the, the use of provocation suggests that you're trying to provoke a certain response or reaction. And argue that some elements of what North Korea does may be designed to provoke a response. Mm -hmm. But many elements of what they're doing is not designed to provoke a response. It's designed to test a capability or a capacity to improve a particular military capability that they have. It's not about provoking a response. It's not about trying to poke somebody to get some reward or poke somebody to get some <laughs> good course of behavior. It's about a blanket military testing or military capability. Mm -hmm. So when the word provocation that specific word, which if yeah. you go through the media and the press and U.S. statements in particular, it's applied to absolutely everything North Korea does. Anything from North Korea saying, we'll turn you into a sea of fire to saying, you know, uh, the U.S. president is a daughter to say, to testing a, a thermonuclear device is a provocation. The, the word itself mm. undermines the ability to have clear analysis of what's mm. happening in North Korea and therefore to shape policy responses. And building on this, would I you, will, oh, the word deterrence is a better term then? Well, I think, it's I mean, a, I think there's that. different words to use at different okay. moments is the point. It's, it's throwing it down to provocation is everything they do is negative and trying to pick a fight. Mm -hmm. And therefore, there's no way to assess what really is going on and how do we understand the directionality of their behavior. To react to that, when a country says that I'm going to turn the capital of your country into a sea of fire, and if we do not see that as provocation, then I think we need to redefine the term. But if you go back to what they've been saying sure. for decades, um, I mean, if you, we hear it all now because of the internet and the change in the, in the media environment, but if you yep. go back and you look at FBIS 
transcripts from the early 90s. Mm -hmm. Even back then, on a daily basis, the North Korean media was calling, you know, the Americans the running dogs and they were going to turn you into a sea of fire all the way back mm -hmm. to the early 90s. And I think that part of what's going on in the current environment is a change in our media landscape. A change that we have social media, we have the internet, it's all much more accessible. You have instantaneous translation. Yeah. And so we have, as a culture or as a country, have not learned to filter out some of that. And so we take every single statement at face value mm -hmm. as opposed to just parking it over here in the compartment of, oh yeah, that's what they always say, they always have, that's what that's sort of Mm. the culture and the, the language that is used, let's ignore that and focus on the relationship. Yes, yeah, so and one difference between what the North Koreans say today and the North Koreans used to say in the 90s is that today this type of statements are usually accompanied by some actions, by some tests or some actions uh, in preparation or in retaliation of the U.S., for example, U.S. ROK joint military exercise. So I agree with you. I think the media does have a frenzy to over-exaggerate or over-interpret the depths of uh, what the North Koreans are really saying. But at the same time, I think when those rhetoric are accompanied by military actions or military tests, I think they would qualify as provocation. Yes, sir, again. One, one more question. How would, uh, there was a question asked about U.S. policy mm -hmm. and changing U.S. policy. Yeah. So we've had a big change, at least verbally, <laughs> You know, three or four presidents who are trying to sort of work a deal with North Korea. Yeah. It's our current president who's being very insightful. Yeah. Insightful. <laughs> okay. How do you view that, or how does the North Koreans view that? Is it good? Is it bad? Or is it not meaningful at all? Well, I think the changed approach from. For example, the Obama's North Korea policy is uh, labeled as strategic patience. Mm -hmm. That we the political um, we don't we don't have the political space in terms of domestic politics to negotiate with North Korea given its bad behavior. So we're going to be patient. We are maintaining our sanctions on North Korea, but at the same time, um, we are also maintaining our military pressure on North Korea. So that was a policy, and the Chinese would criticize crit the Chinese and Russians would criticize this policy for allowing North Korea to continue to develop its nuclear weapons. So what does it take for, or what kind of policy does it take for the United States to really solve this problem with, uh, with North Korea? Is it engagement or is it uh, a limited conflict in the, in the Korean Peninsula that will finally wake up the Chinese and they realize that it cannot go on? I think we don't know that yet. But one consensus or one widely shared opinion is that something has to change for this stalemate to change. And that something could be the back channel diplomacy, it could be the military pressure, it could be a combination of all these factors. But we know for sure that the strategic patience policy has not created the result or the change that we want. Yes, sir. Is there any prospect of changing political forces in, in, in South Korea will have an effect on opening up an otherwise blocked situation? Yes and no. <laughs> yes, because um, we know that the South Korean government, the South Korean president has made it very clear that the military option is not an option. That even if it is an option for the United States, it is not an option for, for, for South Korea. So he has made it very clear that negotiation and talks and engagement with North Korea is the only way to go. But then that raises quite a question of the, the sunshine policies that we saw from President Kim Dae-jung in about 20 years earlier, and whether that has created the results that we want to see. So I would say the South Korea policy is a um, combination of minimum deterrence against North Korea and a principled engagement with North Korea. But that policy so far has not resulted in a change of position on North Korea's part because North Korea's <laughs> biggest negotiation partner or their desired negotiation partner is the United States, it's not South Korea. <coughs> yes, sir. With respect to, to, to China's view, uh, do you think at all that the question of the Chinese Communist Party's own concerns of legitimacy 
uh, given the direction uh, of, of China being uh, further integrated in the world economic scene, is influencing at all their view of needing to support North Korea? Some kind of sense of, of there's relevance to a, a, a communist dictatorship. Uh, does that have anything to do with their view at all? Yeah, that's a great question. So China's national power is rising. Why does China still feel that it needs a strategic asset in that part of the region, right? So that comes to the, the question of how do we evaluate China's comprehensive national power? And we usually use the, the seven indicators, dam field, um, diplomatic information, military, economic, financial, um, and two more, labor and the intelligence. So if we look at the seven indicators, which one is China strong with? Economic. And which one is China weak with? Pretty much all the rest. So although the, on one hand, you see Beijing or the Chinese Communist Party where President Xi feels that we got this game. We got China really going well and we are using our economic coercion and our, our economic influence to get the foreign policy outcomes that we want. There's that if there is going to be conflict with the United States in the region, China doesn't have what it takes to win. And I think that's where on the national security consideration speculation, North Korea matters so much. So. Uh, first of all, thank you for your talk. Uh, thank you. My question is going to be obviously about um, uh, China-Russia relations. Sure. Um, back in Russia, I've heard talk
information to the Chinese public about the Korean Peninsula. And there are also examples of where the um, the South Koreans sponsor research projects in China trying to promote a perception of pro-South Korea public opinion and to promote the friendship between China and South Korea and also at the same time describe North Korea as a as as the most critical problem between the two countries and a threat to regional peace and stability. I think all those factors, the general public opinion um, about the radiation contamination, the Chinese government's allowance uh, or permission for this debate to exist and to prosper, and also the effort by the South Korean government and South Korean organizations to promote this um, anti-North Korea sentiment inside China, I think they all played a pretty large role. And the gentleman. <laughs> when you talk of North Korea, do you think it's called the nation itself, or is it Kim's family, like a gangster clique? They control everything, and if they were removed, mm. it'd be an entirely different country. Yep. Because you mentioned there's no military option, because our allies would be killed. Yep. And then, so yep. Do you see an option for removal of the family Did that occur, and do you believe? North Korean policy towards the rest of the world. That's a great point because that's the op that's the other options that a lot of people here are discussing, which is not regime change but regime modification. That if we cannot change the regime, but maybe we can change the thinking of the regime. We cannot change the thinking of Kim Jong Un himself, but maybe we can change the thinking of his officials and the North Korean people. And the problem with that approach is that that basically equates to informational warfare, right? That we need to send new information and we need to give North Korean people and the mid-level officials the access to different information. And the South Korea in the past has had this, well, I think they still do, they have these louder speakers along the border <laughs> to broadcast into North Korea. And they have these balloons that fly, they fly into North Korea to send in the pamphlet about what is going on outside North Korea. And that has always been perceived as a, a quote, quote, provocation by the North Korean government. And they retaliate by shooting. They retaliate by their military actions. So that is one area, like I remember earlier this year I was interviewed and there was this uh, Navy SEALs saying that, former Navy SEALs, saying that um, to change North Korea, we need to deliver 10 million iPhones into the country and give them free internet access and the, in Korean language. And then the country will change in no time. So that is, that is creative thinking. And that probably will eventually have the effect that we want to see. But for that to happen, we also have to carry major, major military risks of their, of their retaliation. Because that's what the regime is afraid of. So assassination as a policy is out? Uh, <laughs> oh, well, we'll see about that. <laughs> uh, more questions? I think uh, we have nope. time for one more. The only thing I, I want to add to that is there are a lot of iPhones in China. It hasn't changed the issue, right? So I don't know. Did you want to have a quick? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to ask: would, would you like to say anything? I, a lot of it, the discussion has been around military policy, but what about economic policy? Do you have any uh, ideas on what should be a integrated economic policy that would actually help to bring peace in the region? Thirty seconds. Go. <laughs> no, I freeze. <laughs> no, I think first of all, given the UN sanctions they are under, to believe that they have any realistic chance to develop a normal economic relations with the rest of the world is daydreaming. Without removing the sanctions, it's not going to happen. But without their denuclearization, the sanctions will not be removed. So it comes back to the essential issue. How about that? Thirty That's seconds. <laughs> Thank you.